the first Union regiment that marched up Meeting Street in Charleston was the 21st USCT, Colored Infantry, a black regiment, and they accepted the surrender of the city from its mayor. And then they began to hold ceremonies, the black folks of Charleston, they began to hold ceremonies all around the city. They held a parade um, in late March, or was it early April, of 65. They had this huge parade where they had two floats, and they had, on one float they had a little slave auction occurring, a mock slave auction with a woman with her baby being sold away. And on the next float they had a coffin labeled slavery, and it said, Fort Sumter dug its grave April 12th, 1861. And then they plan one more ceremony. Now, and by the way, the war, when it finally, finally, finally ended, they held an extraordinary uh, ceremony on Fort Sumter. Um, they crammed about 3,000 people onto the little island. Uh, all kinds of dignitaries came. Uh, now General Anderson, not the colonel who had surrendered the fort four years ago, came and raised the U.S. flag four years almost to the day it, he had taken it down. William Lloyd Garrison was there from the north, the great abolitionist who wept uncontrollably when he heard a, a, a small black children's choir sing John Brown's body. And the very night of that ceremony, which was tw uh, the 14th of April, they held a, a, a banquet of a sort in a building that had a roof on it back in Charleston. And that was the very night, of course, that Lincoln was assassinated at Ford's Theater in Washington. But the black folks of Charleston had planned one more ceremony. That ceremony was a burial ceremony. It turns out that during the last months of the war, the Confederate Army turned the planter's horse track, a race course, it was called the Washington Race Course, into a open-air cemetery, uh, excuse me, prison. And in that open-air prison, in the infield of the horse track, about 260-odd Union soldiers had died of disease and exposure. And they were buried in unmarked graves in a mass grave site out behind the grandstand of the racetrack. And by the way, there was no more important and symbolic site in low country planter slaveholding life than their racetrack. Well, the black folks at Charleston got organized. They knew about all this. They went to the site. They reinterred all the graves, uh, the, the burial, the men. They couldn't mark them with names. They didn't have any names. And they made them proper graves. And they built a fence all the way around the cemetery, about 100 yards long and 50, 60 yards deep. And they whitewashed the fence. And over an archway, they painted the inscription, Martyrs of the Race Course. And then on May 1st, 1865, they held a parade of 10,000 people on the racetrack, led by 3,000 black children carrying armloads of roses and singing John Brown's body, followed then by black women, then by black men, it was regimented this way, then by contingents of Union infantry. Everybody marched all the way around the racetrack. As many as could fit got into the grave site Five black preachers read from scripture. A children's choir sang the national anthem, America the Beautiful, and several spirituals. And then they broke from that and went back into the infield of the racetrack and did essentially what you and I do on Memorial Day. They ran races, they listened to 16 speeches by one count, and the troops marched back and forth and they held picnics. This was the first Memorial Day. African Americans invented Memorial Day in Charleston, South Carolina. There are three or four cities in the United States, North and South, that claim to be the site of the first Memorial Day, but they all claim 1866. They were too late. I had the great blind good fortune to, to discover this story in a messy, totally disorganized collection of veterans' papers at the Houghton Library at Harvard some years back. And what you have there is black Americans recently freed from slavery announcing to the world with their flowers and their feet and their songs
what the war had been about. What they basically were creating was the Independence Day of a second American Revolution. That story got lost. It got lost for more than a century. And when I discovered it, I started calling people in Charleston that I knew in archives and libraries, including the Avery Institute, the Black Research Center in Charleston. Has anybody, have you ever heard of this story? And no one had ever heard it. It showed the power of the lost cause in the wake of the war to erase a story. But I started looking for other sources, and lo and behold, there were lots of sources. Harper's Weekly even had a drawing of the cemetery in an 1867 issue. The old oval of that racetrack is still there today. If you ever go to Charleston, go up to Hampton Park. Hampton Park is today what the race course was then. It's named for Wade Hampton, the white supremacist redeemer governor of, of South Carolina at the end of Reconstruction and a Confederate general during the Civil War. And that park sits immediately adjacent to the Citadel, the Military Academy of Charleston. On any given day, you can see at any given time about 100 or 200 Citadel cadets jogging on the track of the old race course. There is no marker. There's no memento, there's only a little bit of a memory. Although a few years ago, a friend of mine in Charleston organized a mock ceremony where we reenacted that event, including the, the children's choir, and they made me dress up in a top hat and a funny old 19th century suit and made me get up on a podium and make a stupid speech. <laughs> but there is an effort, at least today, to uh, declare Hampton Park a National Historic Landmark. See you Thursday.